So in this video, I'm going to talk about carbocation rearrangements in SN1 reactions. But more specifically, we're going to talk about hydrides and alkyl shifts. So before I get started, this concept is going to seem kind of weird to you at first. It's essentially hydrogens being able to move to create a more stable carbocation. It's just something you're going to have to remember. And so let's start with an example. So first we're going to talk about the hydride shift. And we're going to start with this molecule right here. So we're going to do an SN1 reaction by adding ETOH and heat. And remember, you need heat or light to essentially start off an SN1 reaction. So as you may recall, the first step is going to be the bromine essentially just leaving. And it's going to take its electrons with it. And so after that occurs, it creates a carbocation. And so this would be your product after that, after the bromine leaves. We're just going to disregard the bromine for now. And so remember, I didn't draw it in, but we have implied hydrogens here. And we have one hydrogen there. And so now, as you can see, the positive charge, or the carbocation, is a secondary carbocation. So secondary carbocation. Actually, let me draw it down there. And so remember, we can do one better than that. A tertiary carbocation is the most stable carbocation. And so there's a way that can form. Essentially, what's going to happen is a hydrogen is going to shift. So this one is going to shift and come on to that carbon. And so pretty much it just trades places. And so your final product after the hydride shift would look something like this. So hydride shift after that occurs. So that's the molecule that you would get. Um, as you can see, I've essentially just drawn the hydrogen that shifts in gold. And so you can see that the positive charge shifts because this carbon right here doesn't have four bonds anymore. So those carbons. And so as you can see, that one has the part, uh, that one becomes a carbocation. And it's more stable because this is a tertiary carbocation. And so this product would be what forms. Hypothetically, if you wanted to, um, you have a hydrogen here as well. But the thing is, if that hydrogen shifts over, you would get a primary carbocation, which is not stable at all and very unlikely to form. And so that's why this hydrogen that's drawn in gold shifts in order to create the tertiary carbocation, which is the most stable carbocation. But it's important to remember, just because it's the most stable doesn't mean that that's going to be the only product that forms. And so now you have those two middle carbocations, and let's see the final products that we get. And so here I've drawn the secondary carbocation, which would be the product formed without rearrangement or a hydride shift. And then on the right, I've drawn what product forms after the hydride shift, so the tertiary carbocation. And so these are going to produce two different products. And let me just draw them. And so after the ETOH attacks and the extra proton gets deprotonated, those would be your final products. So as you can see, the O, the alcohol group, is added on to two different carbons. And so with the rearrangement, you can get two different types of products. 
And so that was the high drive shift where a hydrogen shifts. But now we're going to talk about an alkyl shift, which is where a CH3 or a methyl group essentially shifts instead of the hydrogen. And so what I'm going to do is I'm essentially going to do a harder kind of alkyl shift. But if you wanted a typical alkyl shift, for example, you could essentially just redo what I did, but instead of the golden H or hydrogen, just stick another CH3 or a methyl group off of it. So it would look something like this. The beginning product would be something like this. So essentially the same thing happens, but you just replace the golden hydrogen with an H. So I'm going to do a harder carbocation rearrangement or an alkyl shift problem. And so just take a look at this problem. We're going to just look at the carbocations first. But when I first saw a problem like this, I was thinking, I was really confused. I wasn't sure what was happening. But take a second. Remember that rings can break in order to form a more stable carbocation. And so I'm going to start by numbering the carbons. That really helps. And so I've numbered them. And But one thing you can see is that this secondary carbocation becomes undergoes an alkyl shift and forms a tertiary or more stable carbocation. And so I've numbered them, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And remember that the first carbon, carbon number 1, has a methyl group bonded off of it. And so that's consistent throughout all of this. But essentially, what occurs is this bond right here breaks. Or let's draw it on that one. That bond breaks. And then this carbon essentially is bonded to the fifth one. So what happens is... This bond then forms between 4 and 5. And then so if that happens, carbon number 1 is missing a bond. And then so that becomes the carbocation. And then now that you understand how that forms, um, the next step is essentially just adding on the CH3OH onto the either carbocation. And then, so, let me just erase this so I don't have to draw it over. And so, these two would be your final products with the OCH3 bonding to the carbocation. And that one would be your major product because the tertiary carbocation is formed more easily and quickly. And so, that pretty much just sums it up for carbocation rearrangements. We talked about hydrides and alkyl shifts. And these are really important to consider when um, trying to determine the products of SN1 reactions. So I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please give it a like and share it with your friends.